Welcome to Friday's edition of Big Blue Kickoff Live here on Giants.com as well as the mobile app. He's Paul Dettino. I'm Lance Meadow with you for the next 60 minutes and multiple ways you can interact with us here on the program. You give us a ring, 201-939-4513. You can also check us out on Twitter, hashtag Giants Chat. And as a reminder, you can find the archive of this show and our entire podcast network on the Giants mobile app, podcast platforms everywhere, and at Giants.com slash podcast. And we are excited, actually, to announce a sponsor for Big Blue Kickoff Live. How about that? As the program is now going to be sponsored by Cadillac the official luxury vehicle of the New York football Giants. So big things on the horizon. See, both on and off the field, Paul's very excited because supposedly he may be actually driving a Cadillac before it's all said and done. Well, I don't know if I can work out that deal, well, but I don't it would know. be pretty I've been sweet, told wouldn't it? from my sources that you've been navigating a way in to at least get a test drive on the initial stages. That'd be pretty cool. Is that fair? Do you, you, you know, years ago... Speaking of oh, here we test go. Now drives. we're in store for a really good story. Oh, you're in for yes. a great story. I am now perking up. Years for ago, yes, please. when yes. the old Giant Stadium was still here, and and I don't date to... yourself with this story, by the way. Well, this goes back to the uh, late '80s, okay. and I was the uh, producer for the uh, tailgate show on the old WNEW radio, and uh, Bob Papa and Carl Nelson were the co-hosts, and I used to produce the show, and we got a lot of games in with the fans and stuff. We used to literally have huge crowds outside there just for our program, and one of our sponsors. Uh, happened to be with uh, with Goodyear, and they asked me if I wanted to ride the blimp. There you go. I turned it down. This was this was shortly after the Pizza Hut blimp had crashed in the middle of Manhattan, and that clearly was on your mind. I take it, it. was. Yes, I decided I did not want to be like a piece of cheese sliding off a slice and just making a mess. And so, uh, yes, the Pizza Hut blimp had crashed in Manhattan. Nobody was injured. But that made me decline the invitation to the uh, to the sponsor. Goodyear, the, the sponsor at the time, they they invited me to come over to Teterboro and to do a ride in the blimp, and I passed it up, and I never got asked again. What could have been? What could have? You been? could have shaped some NFL history as a result. So that's of not a car, on. but yeah. it was an opportunity to be in a vehicle, a blimp. Yeah. Okay, so meaning you've gotten your feet barely wet is essentially what you're insinuating. <laughs> okay, because you didn't even go into the actual. I, I, I didn't take the guy up on it. And maybe I should have. I mean, that's a once-in-a-lifetime thing, is. right? That's You've never saying. been in a blimp, app. No, I can't say I've been on the blimp. It's on the to-do list. Is it? It's on the bucket list. Okay. Yeah, I don't know if it's as high as maybe on your bucket list, but I'm working my way to it. Number one on yeah. my bucket list. Another, another bucket story. List. No, no, another story for everybody. Yeah. Number one on my bucket list. Anybody out there who is a talent scout for a cartoon... Number one on my bucket list is I want to be the voice of a cartoon character, whether it be a television show you know, some would say you're or a movie. Ready, a living version oh, of a cartoon. Oh, I'm well aware character. of that, <laughs> which is why I think yeah. I'd be a perfect fit. 100%. But I know, think, come on. What is it? Simpsons? They must have a character I could play just once. Talent was, scouts, if you're out there, come on. TV, movie producers. I'm sure producers. they're all listening in. One time, doing, yes. I want to be the voice of a cartoon character. That's at the top of my bucket what list. What was your favorite cartoon growing up, just out of curiosity? Oh, I was a big Batman guy. Batman, okay. Yeah, Batman used to be on TV when I was little as a cartoon. Oh, Batman used not to be just, on TV? I had no clue. Not Thank just you. as yeah. the Wasn't sure about Adam that. West Batman, yeah. but there well, were Well, that's also... what I was thinking. I thought you grew up watching Adam no, West Batman. Oh, there was yeah. a cartoon, a Batman cartoon that I watched when I was a kid growing up that was a real big deal. I'm okay. a big Batman guy. Well, you know, keep the dream alive to get that cape on one day. I'm pulling for you. you know? Appreciate that. They, they may actually forget the cartoon voice. DC is now blowing up, okay? Forget Marvel. DC is making new and new movies. I, I think know. you may actually have a real life. You could play Paul Dettino, the oh. real life character, in one of the upcoming Batman movies. How about that? But if I were a villain, we'd all have to be slanted like this. Yes. Right? You remember the TV show? Sure. No, no, the I villain's remember. lairs yeah. were always slanted. Absolutely. And you know why? Yeah. Because this, was, this is true. Because the villains were always crooked. Uh, look, so wow. they made sure I mean, that their lair was crooked on the screen. The wealth that? of information that you were providing. Speaking of wealth of information, <laughs> let's return to the somewhat topic at hand. I don't know if we've covered everything about every facet of Paul Dottino's life yet. We'll try to squeeze that in on the remainder of the program. But probably the biggest news today is Brian Dable speaking to the media with respect to the injury report. He indicated that nobody has been ruled out at this point, and everybody will be practicing in some capacity today. Now, yes. the injury report is not going to come out until after this program, and we know Andrew Thomas was upgraded to limited yesterday. Azizo Jalari popped up on the injury report. He was limited. Both are dealing with hamstring issues, and 
just to put Darren things in Waller perspective, too. Darren Waller too. But Waller, we knew had already been dealing with a hamstring and issue. And said yesterday he will play. He Correct. already insisted And that. it's a nerve issue. It's not necessarily him re-aggravating mm-hmm. what he was dealing with last season, even though it is the same leg, though. Well, he said he it's scar with. tissue. Correct. The buildup of scar tissue. tissue. The buildup of yeah. scar tissue um, as pressed against the hammy and sometimes causes him a little tightness. So he said he's dealing with it. He's getting used to it. He didn't <clears throat> indicate that he's concerned about no, it, perhaps not at all. getting to a point where it would sideline him. But like anything else, the team will be monitoring it. But, you know, Paul, with hamstring issues, you just you never know with these things. You can wake up one day, you can feel great, right? And then the next day, all of a sudden, it tightens up on you. So you it do have happen. to walk a fine line sure. with respect to that. And, you know, folks, let's make something clear. It's 102, at least the forecast in, uh, in Arizona, which is where the Giants will be heading tomorrow following a walkthrough. Now, even though the game will be inside and it'll be 72 degrees inside uh, – the Cardinal Stadium. State Farm Stadium. Yeah, yeah, I don't go with the sponsor. It's Cardinal Stadium. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. We don't My need, apologies. We, okay. They're not sponsoring the show, by the way. No, just they're to not. Clarify, but now, yes, if they ahead. want to, yeah. we could go there. One, and then you'd be a huge fan of the I stadium would be. in Arizona. But right now, okay. it's at the Cardinal Stadium. I see how you work. Yeah. When it, it benefits you, we'll talk about it. When there it you go. In there any go. event, yeah. the point is, uh, for the long flight, which is about six hours, and then when they get there and so forth and so on in that climate, hydration is going to be very, very important because you will get the cramping yeah. and the potential for these soft tissue injuries. And so the Giants need to be very much aware of. They've already had the training staff school them on start your hydration today. Don't even wait till tomorrow. Start the day so that you've got enough fluids in your body. See, I could see you as the individual on the airplane walking up aisle to aisle, making sure and checking in all the players no, 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 no. that they have quality water. I hang on the wing. <laughs> well, I will hope you get to Arizona in one piece. I wasn't going to go that far out. I was just saying that I could see you making sure that the players are taken care of in terms of hydration. That's fine. Because you don't want to all of a sudden have any surprises come no, up on no, game day. Yeah. Definitely and make not. sure that you hydrate yourself too. We're all so worried about your well being. Want to make sure you could survive on the sideline, even though it's an indoor facility, as you yes. mentioned. But we still want to make sure that you're in one hundred percent. Yes. Now the assistant coaches also spoke to the media earlier today and clearly the one of note was Bobby Johnson the offensive line coach, Mm -hmm. given the struggles that the Giants had in that department. And he was asked several different questions. He was asked about whether or not he thought the guard rotation during training camp in the preseason contributed to some of the miscues of the struggles. He didn't think that was an issue. He made no excuses. He said, listen, all five guys had something that went wrong, and they had more than enough film to evaluate. But he pretty much... Also, Paul echoed the same sentiments as Brian Dable, the players, and the coaches. And and this is, I think, one of the major takeaways. Whether fans wanted to hear more of a reaction, it seemed as if they're all of the mindset that once they reviewed the film, they were ready to move on to Done. Arizona. And I know it's the cliched line with Bill Belichick using a few years ago onto Cincinnati, but the truth is everything they're preaching, they are all on the same page with respect to that. You'd be hard-pressed to get them to want to talk any more about this Dallas game. He used the phrase, that is Bobby Johnson, uh, used the phrase closing the book. Yeah. Close the book on Dallas. That's it. Looked at it. Uh, saw what needed to be corrected, figured out some techniques that they wanted them to use against Arizona, and closed the book on Dallas. Done. Looking forward to the Cardinals. But Thomas McGahee was the same way yesterday, right? Mm-hmm. They were trying to ask him questions about the block field goal. He didn't want any part of it. He was like, we turned the page. We've moved on. You know, just so people understand this, on Thursdays, the coordinators have their press sessions or their media briefings, if you will. And what what I always find laughable about it is that these staffs uh, will review a game on Sunday night. Let's just say it's a Sunday game. I don't want to get too into Thursday night and all that other stuff on Monday night. Sunday game. The staff reviews the game as soon as it's over. They get the immediate video on the chips. They'll review the game as soon as it's over. They'll grade it overnight, okay? And then even early into the wee hours Monday morning. By the time they get to Monday night, after they do their corrections with the team in a walkthrough on Monday morning or sometime around noon, they're already getting the scouts' information and processing what they want to do with their game plan so that Monday night, when the staff sits down, they are 150% focused on the game plan because that's what they're constructing so that the team has a framework to work through during the course of the week. 
to ask a assistant coach on Thursday morning, do you remember that middle middle of the third quarter play when so and so got beat on a pass rush? Is it's almost laughable because these coaches will tell you, well, it's been since Monday night that we were all in on the upcoming opponent. You're talking about all day Tuesday, all day Wednesday, yep. into Thursday morning. Is it any wonder when some of these assistant coaches say, look, I, I can barely remember that. I've already moved on to the next yeah. game. You flipped the script. Their focus is 150% on how they're going to win the upcoming game. Thinking about last week's game does them no good by the time it gets to Thursday. So, you know, my feeling has always been you talk to the players after the game about the game you just saw. If you need to review something on Monday, we get the opportunity to talk to the head coach on Monday and usually at least a couple of players if it's going to be a, a video chat. Yep. Okay. Okay. By Tuesday, that's it. Move on. Move on to the next game. But, you know, it boggles my mind how many questions these assistants get on Thursday about four days ago when you know that they're not even giving that stuff a second thought. They're just not. Is it any wonder you're not going to get answers or or even if they give you answers, there's not much there? They've already forgotten about it. Well, that's why actually, and listen, every team chooses its own schedule. The but game's buried. It's done. Why bother? Sure. But that's why you have some teams, they have their coordinators speak on Monday or Tuesday right after the game. So that to your point, it's fresh on their mind. They can address it and then move on. The Giants, and this has been like this for multiple coaching staffs. So it has. It's not as if this is brand new. They tend to have their coordinators speak more closer to the upcoming game as opposed to the previous mm -hmm. game, and to each their own. You know, I'm more interested in hearing about, from Mike Kafka, how you're dealing with Buda Baker, who's yeah. been to the Pro Bowl five times in his NFL career. He is a disruptive force. He makes big plays. I'd rather hear him talk about that than, oh, uh, you know, you didn't get this, you didn't get this. How can you get uh, Darius Slayton going after, uh, you know, how, how come the wide receivers didn't make more plays the other night against Dallas? <laughs> Are you kidding me? Seriously? Well, right now, we're focused also more on Arizona. And let's delve into this matchup a little bit because I think when you look at this team, and we talked about them when we were previewing them, each and every opponent during the offseason, clearly the Cardinals, they parted ways with some key personnel. Kyler Murray's heard, and everybody expected this is going to be a team that is going to struggle and barely win football games. And I know yeah. weird things happen in week one, but I was very impressed with the defensive side of the ball out of the Arizona Cardinals against Washington in the opener. I saw an aggressive and athletic group of players that had a knack for getting after the quarterback. They had six sacks. You could say some of that was Sam Howell holding on to the football. I get it. But mm -hmm. I think a lot of it also was a product of some of these shifty pass rushers. And they got three takeaways, too and one of which they turn that into a touchdown. So the reason why I want to start off and highlight the defense first, from a talent perspective, is it anywhere near the Cowboys' defense, Paul? No. Do they have a Micah Parsons? Do they have a Demarcus Lawrence with that level of resume and that consistency? Absolutely not. But I think this is a defense where the sum is greater than the individual parts. Mm -hmm. What I mean is, as a group, they can fit into each and every equation and perform admirably, but maybe from an individual standpoint, you don't see one guy in particular taking over the game. The Cardinals' best attribute on defense is speed. Yeah. Because they don't have a, a superstar to lead in roster. So what they've done is they've got a lot of fast guys, so they just want to be able to run around like a bunch of mosquitoes and basically make sure that they can track you down. Swarm to the ball. Right. That's it. So what you want to do against a defense like that is you want to get very, very physical with them. You want to pound it. You want to use your strength and your size. The Giants have more 300-pound players on their team, and I know it's only relevant because you only have certain guys on the field at one time. So it's not, it's not necessarily a big stat. But the Giants are a big team. I think it's fair to say they're a bigger team than most. Uh, they have, for the most part, above average strength on their roster. And so you want to play bully ball against the team that is somewhat challenged talent-wise and relies on speed. 
They want you to try to outrun them so that they can track you down or they can swarm to you. So this is a team that you want to sock it to them. You want to play bully ball. The Giants should not have much trouble using that philosophy against them. I don't think Washington played enough bully ball the other day, and they allowed the Cardinals to do some things defensively that they should not have been allowed to do. Well, and they also did a really nice job containing the Washington run game. Sam Howell, for example, who's a great athlete, he only ran twice. He did score a touchdown on the second one, but even Antonio Robinson, Antonio Gibson, excuse me, and Brian Robinson were limited in terms of their effect. Robinson actually had a receiving touchdown. He didn't run in. It's interesting you said play bully ball because I would argue the Cardinals established their physicality, Paul, early in that game. Washington's first touchdown, mm-hmm. they had three penalties, Arizona, for 67 yards. I mean, they were laying out gifts because Arizona was going for the jugular immediately. And the Cardinals, they settled down as the game progressed. But you could tell, I mean, they were looking to cut off Washington immediately. And the refs obviously came in and said, okay, guys, we understand you're energetic and so forth, but you got to play at a certain level and a certain rhythm. So I think maybe... Th- My point is there's a little bit of an underrated physicality to this Arizona team. I was talking about the defense. No, I'm referring to the defense. You want to flip the page to offense, they would rather play bully ball on offense because James Conner is a 230-plus pound back who's over six feet tall, and from his days with the Steelers, he has shown the ability to be durable, to be physical. He's not afraid of anybody. I mean, he, he will put his shoulder down, sure. and he'll try to run through you, and he'll try to drag tacklers an extra yard or two. He is he is a bully ball type of running back. Not a superstar, but a bully ball type of back. So I do think offensively the Cardinals would like to rely on him, especially since Dobbs has only been there for a few weeks, Yeah, the quarterback. Uh, I don't think there's any doubt about that, that they'd like to do that offensively, but defensively they're based on speed. No, they are. I just I saw some physicality out of them early on, and then I think they got back they to were more of the up athleticism for day. and the speed. And it could be a product of that, one hundred percent. As far as the offense is concerned, the Cardinals, his average yards per pass attempt was four point four yards. Now, mm-hmm. part of that is to your point, he only had about five or six practices with the offense before no they even got into the game. Now, just like if you're going to make the argument, well, Isaiah Simmons is going to get more and more comfortable with the Giants' defense, well, then you have to say the same thing about Joshua Dobbs and the offensive personnel. They now have another week, so they're going to get a little bit more comfortable. Does that mean that the Cardinals are going to start going for home runs as opposed to singles and bunts? I don't know if I'd go that far, but this is the best way I would sum it up. This is a tackling game for the Giants, okay? Because what they like to do, Paul, is they like to get their elusive weapons out in open space— and rely on yardage after the catch. We saw reverses and screens with Connor, with Rondell Moore. We'll see whether or not they get Hollywood Brown a little bit more involved. The tight ends in the middle of the field. That means that if the Giants want to do damage control, if Dobbs is going to make a five-yard pass, then keep it to five or six yards. No doubt. Do not allow it to get to 10 or 11, because the more and more you allow that, that's when now Dobbs and company don't have to put together an eight-play, 90-yard mm-hmm. drive where it's more likely they're going to back themselves into a mistake. That, to me, is priority number two. Priority number one is to stop Connor. Sure. Don't let them be multidimensional because if Connor can consistently run the ball, remember his average yards per carry for his career, and he's been around for, what, six or seven he was with years, the Steelers prior. is yeah. over four yards a pop. He's a legitimate, productive guy who makes, makes the chains move. Stuff him. Be very, very nasty up front. Play bully ball with your front seven. And contain Connor. Shut him down. Don't just contain him. Shut him down. Do that. Put the game in Dobbs' hands. Then priority number two is don't allow yak yardage. You do that, you suffocate the Cardinals. Yeah, because, I mean, Arizona did not put on an offensive clinic. They had one touchdown due to a defensive score. And... You could argue they were in position to win the game. Dobbs fumbled the ball on consecutive possessions, and Washington had an extremely shortened field where they got a touchdown and then ultimately tacked on the field goal. So it wasn't as if Arizona was moving the ball up and down the field, but if you allow those elusive weapons to get out and they could do damage, that's when all of a sudden you alleviate the quarterback. So that, to me, is an extremely prevalent storyline. Yeah, before we get to the calls, Dobbs has mobility. 
Oh, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And, and you certainly need to make sure that you're aware of that because you don't want him to accidentally extend the play and burn you. Yeah. You know, because he'll go off script a little bit. Talking to one of the Giants defensive linemen yesterday, I specifically asked him about the limited film that Dobbs has out there. He's only started three games in the NFL, and he's been around for like five years. Well, he was with Pittsburgh for many years you in know. Tennessee. He threw his first touchdown pass last season. So, so this will be his fourth pro start. And, and given that there is so little film, I said, how much of that film study is really relevant here because there isn't that much? Do you have to kind of feel your way through his tendencies as the game goes on? And he said, there's no question. You, you need to, to continue to, from the very first part of the game. You can have to continue to process the information to figure out what is he trying to do. As the game goes on, you can't really scout it and base everything on a scouting report. You have to get more of a firsthand feel for him. And so the Giants' uh, defense needs to be very much aware, especially early, that they could see surprising developments out of this quarterback because they just don't have enough of a file on him. Yeah, especially also Drew Petzing, the offensive coordinator, was the Cleveland Browns QB coach. So he was with Dobbs last mm -hmm. season in Cleveland. But Petzing didn't call plays. It wasn't his offense, no. Paul. We're talking no. about it was Kevin Stefanski and Alex Van Pelt. So there's really, I would say, there's newness not just with Dobbs. There's newness with respect to this offense. No question. Because Petzing is a first-time offensive coordinator. So to your point, could Arizona have some tricks up its sleeve that it didn't tap into and utilize last week? 100%. Remember, the Giants were very much in a similar position to Arizona last season where the Giants were the land of the unknown mm -hmm. because you had the infusion of Dable and Kafka and yet Wink operating with the Giants as opposed to Baltimore. So now Arizona is in that area where they're operating in the gray as opposed to black and white and you got to be on high alert, I think is a good way to put it. And I don't think the Giants are taking this opponent for granted. But one last thing I want to point out in terms of individual defenders, and this is why I wouldn't overlook this facet of the team, Dennis Gardeck, who's mainly been a special teamer throughout his career. He had two sacks against yes, Washington. You know, He's developed into a notable pass rusher. Kaiser White was in the Philadelphia scheme with mm -hmm. Jonathan Gannon. They brought him over to play in the middle. He's a very active linebacker. And Zayvon Collins is a player who was scratching the surface under the old regime, and he seems to be a little bit more comfortable, and he had an interception. So I know you brought up Buda Baker and Jalen Thompson. They have two really good secondary players, but I'm looking more of the guys in the front seven. Those are three to keep close tabs on because they're active athletes as we started the conversation with. So that's an idea of what to expect from the Arizona Cardinals as the Giants gear up for their matchup coming your way on Sunday at 4.05 p.m. Eastern. A few reminders before we open up the phone lines in terms of various different elements in play here. The Giants Huddle Podcast, you could check that out. You can head to your favorite podcast platform. You can go to Giants.com slash podcast. Giants fans, take your fandom to the next level. A season ticket membership. Stay connected to the club all year round, not just on game days. Memberships are now available for the 2023 season. To learn more about all the exclusive member benefits, visit Giants.com slash tickets. Limited inventory is available. And if you don't want to go the season ticket route, you can pick and choose with single game options. The official schedule is out. They're on sale now. Don't miss the Giants at MetLife Stadium this season. Visit Giants.com slash tickets to secure your seat. You could run or walk with Giants legends. The Giants Foundation will host a 5K race and kids run. It's presented by Quest Sunday, October 8th, 9 a.m. Eastern, MetLife Stadium. Net proceeds will benefit the Giants Foundation. All participants will receive a commemorative T-shirt. After the race, you could stay for a post-race festival with appearances by Giants legends as well as a DJ. Register now at Giants.com slash 5K. And last but not least, the Giants official connected TV streaming app. It's Giants TV. Brings you original video content game highlights on demand and direct to Big Blue fans. Giant TV, it's free. It's on Apple TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV as well as the Giants mobile app. All right, let's open up the lines, 201-939-4513. First up is Noel in New Jersey. He gets us going here on Big Blue Kickoff Live. What's happening, Noel? Hey, guys. How you guys doing? We're doing all right. Hi. What's on your mind? Good. Well, first of all, we're not going to talk about last week. Uh, obviously, we want to move by, but I want to see what John Michael Schmidt does and how he gels with the offensive line, and maybe he becomes that leader uh, maybe he takes our offensive line to the next step, but I'm really excited to see what we're doing with that. 
Uh, I also want to see, obviously, Cardinals. We got Isaiah Simmons. Like, let's let's get him involved in our defense. He could play so many different positions. I want to see if his role steps up. And then lastly, we still need a wide receiver. I love everybody that we have, and nobody's going to like this except for Sterling Shepard. But can we go out there and get a Chase Claypool, somebody who could really separate and become a – a number one target for Daniel Jones. I'm excited to see what we do over the next few weeks with that. But, yeah, no doubt we bounce back. You know, the only thing I could tell from us losing last week is that we're not going to go undefeated. So that, that's that's my only <laughs> – Well, going out on a limb on that one there, Noel. Yeah. Well, we appreciate the phone call. We'll let you go on that note. Thanks for weighing a in. A mathematical yeah. major right there, Well, right? I mean, once again, he's putting A and B together to get to C. It's truly amazing. That is an eye-opening statement right there. We, uh, we were still at the point where the jury was out as to whether or not the Giants would go undefeated. Yeah. But anyway, as far as the wide receiver, a little bit surprising that already we're receiving phone calls about somebody yeah, wanting to go out and grab a wide receiver. Wondell Robinson's coming back. And let's face it, you didn't really see much of anything in terms of the operation of this no. offense because no. they lost in the trenches. And Dallas completely dominated in that area. I'll go to the uh, Simmons comment. I talked to Isaiah yesterday and asked him specifically about how much of the playbook does he feel he's gotten down. And he said, all of it. And I said, all of it? He said, yeah. And I said, you feel comfortable running everything? He said, I do. I said, that's pretty quick. He said, I'm telling you, I've got the whole thing down. And he said, what I love about it is that I can run any of these plays from virtually anywhere on the field. Yeah, It doesn't matter where they're starting me out. I can, I can run it. He said, if they want me to cover, I can be in one spot, two spots, three spots on the field, and I can still run that coverage. He's extremely excited about uh, playing for Wink Martindale. He can't say enough about this coordinator. Now, whether or not he has a great game against the Cardinals, he did say there's no emotion involved. And the reason there can't be any emotion involved, because he believes that would be detrimental. That if he lets emotions get involved in the game, that it will impact his ability to be efficient, which would then hurt the Giants' chances of winning. So he's going into this as a business trip, as just another opponent. Whether or not he can keep those feelings in check, that remains to be seen. But his intention is just to go out there and do what Wink wants him to do. It's going to be interesting with respect to the emotion part, and I understand it's easy to say that, but you know, unlike the rest of the Giants players, he's the only one that has ties to everybody on the opposing sideline because yeah. he was just there. Because Buda Baker was also asked about seeing Isaiah Simmons for the first time since he was traded because they are very close. Baker was a mentor for Isaiah Simmons mm-hmm. when he was in Arizona, and Baker said, listen, we'll shake hands, we'll greet before the game, and then once the game starts, I couldn't care less about the right, relationship. Right. So, but once again, everyone knows Isaiah Simmons on the Arizona roster. Isaiah is the only one on the Giants roster that yeah. can relate to all the Arizona guys. So that'll be interesting to see once they have their initial interaction. But the other thing that Isaiah pointed out in that meeting with the media that you talked about, and this is something that he really is going to have to adapt to, where one week he may play a boatload of snaps because Wink says, Isaiah, you're a great matchup. The following week, Paul, he may not have that big of a role. So the one thing for any player to adjust to, I think, Wink's system is you could go from being a prominent guy that's highlighted Mm -hmm. to all of a sudden becoming an afterthought. We've seen this last season, right, with the Giants personnel. There's a defensive back, a corner, plays unbelievable one week, and then... The following week, you don't see much of him. So I think that's going to be maybe the biggest adjustment for a player like Isaiah Simmons. The one thing that will help him and probably keep his head in the game, the Giants have already put him on special teams. And, you know, I can say it now. I wasn't going to tell people this before the Dallas game because it was kind of classified information. But they absolutely plan to use him on specials. When he was at Clemson, in his three years with the Tigers, he had 23 solo special teams tackles. He is an absolute monster on special teams. He's an athletic guy, yeah. And and they're aware of that because of his speed and his size and his length. He can be a big special teams force. And so now that he's played a game on specials, which we saw in Dallas, I feel free enough to at least mention that to you. It's something I had to keep under wraps. But between him, Nick McLeod, uh, Taiwan Jones, I felt like the Giants special teams were going to get a very late infusion of some quality players 
who could wind up being the core of this unit. And obviously, special teams, because of the field goal uh, unit, oh, yeah. had tremendous problems the other day. But the coverage units, they didn't have a lot of work. But I think the coverage units actually did their job against Dallas. And that's what happens, Paul, when you have a lot of movable parts, right? Thomas McGee talks about this every week. You have certain players at your disposal, one week injuries. They take guys away. You have mm -hmm. new guys. So it's not surprising that there were some ups and downs in terms of the opener. A funny side story to your point about Simmons being on special teams, being classified information. I like to go back and listen to the press conferences of the Giants' opponent to get their perspective mm -hmm. of how things played out. So I was listening to John Fossil the Cowboys special teams coach. And he had mentioned that, you know, they were in this feel it out process with the Giants because they didn't know who was going to be utilized on special teams. So John Fossil was saying, you know, they go out and they see Isaiah Simmons, Kayvon Thibodeau being utilized on special teams. I was like, okay, you know, now we got to account for some different people. So I think a lot <laughs> of He wasn't teams, getting any help from me, no, that's well, for sure. I wasn't expecting you to, even though the Fossil name is tied to the No, 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 no help. You still no won't help. go there. No you help. You still won't go there. Okay, we know where your alliance is and your allegiance. We're at least glad that we got some clarity on that front. All right, let's head back to the phone lines here as we move forward on BBKL. We got Dan in Michigan joining us here. What's happening, Dan? Welcome aboard. Hey, that's Dave in Michigan. Dave in Michigan. Okay. Dan became Dave. We're not sure, but we'll take your word for it. So what's happening? Yes. That's right. P, P Dad knows who it is. Yeah. Um, how are you, Dave? I'm good, man. I'm good. Hey, uh, I want to say about Sunday's game, I haven't called all week on it. The reason why we were all on the ledge after, you know, by halftime is that true Giant fans hate, and I mean hate, the Cowboys, the Eagles, and the, and the Washington Commanders on a cellular level. And we were looking forward to this game for nine months. Sure. So I just want to put it in perspective. That said, by Monday morning, I looked at that game. Uh, did, do you guys play golf? No. No. Not regularly. I used to play, but not now. All right, so sometimes when you go to the golf course and you've, 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 cracked, you know, you've been at the range, you've, you've gotten there early, you've done the putting, and you get to the first tee and you, you hit a worm burner for 50 yards. And, and it just keeps getting worse to the point when you're at the 12th or 13th hole, you just want to walk off. And that was at that. That was what that game was mm -hmm. for, for, for Mr. Um, But you go out a couple of days later to another golf course, and you play great. And you know it, it's one of those things. Anyway, I just wanted to say that. Um, why are we trying out new players at wide receiver? I don't. I don't get that. Dave, they bring in a handful of players every single week throughout the course of the season to run them through quick interviews and quick workouts to compile what's known as the short list. Every personnel department or general manager in this league has a short list. And by bringing in all these different guys, they keep adjusting the short list based on who's available and who performs better in these visits. That short list is at every single position on the team. Every position. And it's basically meant for an emergency situation that if you get into a bad spot injury-wise, you can get someone from the short list in here on a moment's notice without having to do any research on them and say, okay, we need somebody. Come in and give us, give us a hand. That's what it's okay. about. So many times it's about the availability of, of when that player can come in. So by the Giants having a couple of receivers in the other day, they happen to be available. They were willing to come in. You put them, on the, you, you put them through the uh, process, and if they did well, they get put on the short list. It doesn't mean they were looking to sign a receiver this week. Okay. Yeah, it's basically doing your due diligence. If memory serves me correctly, actually, before the Giants signed Landon Collins... They had brought him in previously. About two or three yeah. weeks earlier. And then they ultimately signed okay. him. So that's a perfect example of what we're talking about. So, And, and I do want to speak about the O-line. Um, 
So Evan Neal, everybody's talking about Evan Neal. Um, I was willing to say, um, you know, I, I know it's going to be frustrating, but this line with a rookie center and still evolving from last year is going to need eight or nine games for us to real and that is if they all stay on the field. Sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. For us to to really see where we're at. And then the other day, and I love Jonathan Casillas on the show. I think he's a wonderful analyst. Um, he basically is already talking about shifting Evan Neal to guard next year, but acknowledging that he's our plan A for this year as long as he stays on the field. And that has to be the, 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 you know, that just is the way it is. So what do you guys think about uh, Kafka's and Johnson's ability to, to scheme blocking, uh, you know, to, to come up with blocking schemes where, where we get help, where there's help on the right side? Look, All right, Dave, we'll, we'll let you go on that point then and appreciate the phone call. I think this is part of the reason why I've always advocated for a fullback. You see, a fullback can help in many ways. He can help in your short passing game because he can flare out. He can help by picking up the leaky guy who's coming in from that defensive front. He can just stay inside and become, or in the backside, to help with pass protection just because he has an assignment to, to pick up some guy. He could also help be the lead blocker for your for your tailback or your, your halfback, whatever you want to call him. I've always advocated a fullback. The Giants, like most teams in the NFL today, don't necessarily advocate for that. The Niners with Jusek, who's been to the Pro Bowl yeah, the Giants, yeah. uh, he we will see him on Thursday. Yep. That's just the way it is. I would have preferred that the Giants decided to have a fullback on this team, not just to help out Barkley, to give him a nice lane to go through, like Joe Morris used to go behind Maurice Carthon, and Tiki Barber used to go behind uh, Jim Finn. I, I, you know, I, I'm a big advocate of that, and I also think that the fullback is a, is a component in pass pro uh, because it gives you an additional option instead of just saying we're going to, you know, uh, double team somebody on the line or we're going to throw the tight end over there. You know, or go double tight end. I'll be honest with you. I'm playing bully ball this week. I'm not only using a lot of double tight ends. I'm going to go with some triple tight ends against the Cardinals because I'm going to bludgeon them to death with, with Saquon Barkley. That's what I'm going to do. That That's one potential solution, which I don't think the Giants will use. They don't seem to be inclined to have a fullback on this team. One thing to keep in mind, I think if Tommy Sweeney was healthy, that may have been a fullback-esque option. I know he's a tight end, but based on his usage in Buffalo and his familiarity, mm -hmm. that may have created... And then Myrick got hurt, too. Correct. So you have to take that into consideration, Paul, in terms Maybe. of what you're talking about. They may Maybe. have had the intention of using some of those players. Unfortunately, they aren't available. Evan Neal, 14 starts, okay? He has not even finished his rookie year. So I think we have to... I would agree with one of the sentiments the last caller mentioned. You need to see a complete set, at least, can he get through a rookie year before we rush the judgment, right? <laughs> I mean, 14 games, 13 last year, he missed four, and he's got one start this year. So, you know, let him get beyond the hurdle of a rookie year, a full rookie year being under his belt. I actually, I spoke with Mark Schlereth, the three-time Super Bowl champ, Fox NFL analyst who's going to be on the call this weekend, and here's where you got to walk the fine line he was mentioning in terms of help because he felt from what he saw against the Cowboys and I suggest you go and listen to the conversation. I don't want to summarize the whole thing, but to take a big story and make it the key point here, he indicated that guys like Evan Neal were overthinking where the assignments were being sacrificed because they were going to the right when they should have stayed on the left. So my point is you got to be careful when you expect help because then guys get so overwhelmed, mm -hmm. Paul, that they get lost within a game. So I know this is the simplification, but – the overall improvement of the individuals in handling their one-on-one -on -one assignments needs to be the priority I agree. before we start talking about you take player A, you take player B, you mm -hmm. take player C. I would That's agree all I'm that. going to say with respect to that. The paralysis by analysis is a very, very interesting phrase that can come into play. And when yeah. people say, oh, you know, Neil looks slow, blah, 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 blah. 
part of that is probably because maybe he's thinking too much. You know, they always tell you, if you got the rapid-fire instincts going upstairs, the physicality is going to be a hell of a lot quicker below the, below the neck. And I, I think that's part of the issue for him. But that's, you know, it's again, it's one game. It's one game. And as far as the other comment about where does he need to go, there's no question that with the thin roster at tackle, there's no way in the world he's getting moved to guard this year. Now, if you want to have that conversation after the season, maybe you can dabble in the conversation. But there's no way he's moving into guard this season because the Giants have plenty of guards that they can throw into the lineup, including Lemieux, who did not play last week, McKeithen, who had a jersey but did not get into the game. Yep, They've got guards they can plug in if they want to. And Azudu, too. Well, Zudu already did. He played some. Yeah. The point is... Tackles? No, no. Tackles, it's tissue paper thin at tackle. What what options do you have? Well, uh, Izudu and McKeithen, for example, could kick out to tackle. But McKeithen's once again, not, yeah, they that's not see an him ideal as a tackle. situation. It's the two starters and Matt Paird. And Matt Paird also is dealing with an injury. Paird's got elbow. a uh, yeah. elbow. elbow. Yeah. But but he's fine practicing this week. He's, right. he's good to go. But what I'm just saying is, is that you had two of your three tackles. Right. That already banged up, and so you're only a week Neil, into the Neil's season. not moving this year. And again, if you want to dabble in that conversation for a few seconds, maybe you could do it at the end of the season. I still don't think that's going to happen because he'll play well enough that you won't want to move him. It just seems impractical. And I do think Dallas's personnel wreaked havoc too. I would not overlook Arizona, but when Micah Parsons is moving right to left and he's all of a sudden creeping up on you, you can understand offensive linemen are thinking. They don't have to play the Cowboys every well, week. Well, that's what I'm it's saying. Okay. Is Dennis Gardek doing that to Andrew Thomas and Evan Neal this week? No. Probably not. But I will say this, Paul. If those guys get some early success in the game, that's when it can change from a mental standpoint. Well, you- that's why you don't want to let the Cardinals establish any momentum. Yeah, because that's exactly what the Cardinals managed to do against Washington. Josh is in Arizona joining us here on BBKL. What's happening, Josh? What do you got for us? Hey, Lance and Paul. Hi. How we doing? Good. Uh, first time caller, long time listener. Welcome. Well, um, we're glad that you branched out and are now taking the ultimate risk in phoning. <laughs> well, listen, listen, you guys are coming to Arizona. I, I had to call up. Sure. Um, but, yeah, I'm going to be at this game on Sunday, and um, I almost kind of feel like this is like a debut game for the Giants just because last week was so sloppy and ugly, and um, I'm kind of just looking forward to seeing the Giants turn loose all of their weapons. You want to see and the real so- Giants on Sunday, and I could not agree with you more. Because what I saw the other day was not the 53-man roster that I've watched for six weeks. The real Giants will show up in Arizona. I think so, too, Paul. And um, I think the two spots that I'm really going to be focusing on is the receivers. I'd love to see, you know, Paris Campbell get going, Waller, of course. Um, And then I want to see the two rookie cornerbacks. Um, You know, Cardinals don't have the greatest receivers, but Marquise Hollywood Brown is no chump. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's a deep threat. Yeah, he, he is a deep threat, so I'd like to see if these rookie corners can hang with them. Um, so, yeah, I'm really looking forward to the game. Uh, Paul, John, are you guys going to be around well, after John's the John's not here, so but I've been called worse throughout my life, so it's okay. I'll let that one slip. <laughs> no, no, but yeah. I know John travels to the game. He sure. does. He'll be there. I'll be there also. Okay, well, I'll try to see if I can find you guys. I'll be on the sideline. It won't be hard to find me. (laughs) All right, Josh, appreciate the uh, phone call. With respect to the Cardinals personnel, he mentioned Hollywood Brown. I brought up Rondell Moore. Mm -hmm. You got speedsters on this Arizona team. That, to me, is the best way. They got a lot of athleticism and speed on both sides of the ball. Do they have, you know, the possession receiver that is going to kill you with a thousand different cuts? I don't know if I'd go that far, but if you lose sight of a guy— He'll absolutely beat you. That's why tackling, once again, is the biggest priority in this game. I'm going to ask you to put the brakes on that for a second because Zach Ertz has done that to the Giants Well, but he's not a, rec- he's not a wide receiver, though. He's a tight Part end. of the passing game. Okay, that's fine. Ertz yeah. has caught a touchdown pass in five straight games against the Giants, all with Philly before he joined Arizona a couple of years back. But, but that's a guy who has been a many-time yeah. thorn in the Giants' foot 
I mean, oh man, I, I, I don't even want to, I don't even want to think about looking at that guy. I was so glad to get him out of the division. Well, then you wind up playing games outside of the division. I hate to break it to you. There's only six within the division. Him and Trey McBride, by the way, because McBride is now in year two. Yes. So they have Quality two player. tight ends. Yeah, those are the possession guys, if you want to go there. Yeah. Where if Dobbs wants to convert a shorter third down, yeah, those are the two guys that you want to look out for. But as far as the corners that the last caller was referring to, meaning having the two rookies being tested, it's more of Rondell Moore mm -hmm. and Hollywood Brown, no especially doubt. since both of those guys can be out on the boundary. Banks did a nice job the other night, by the way, in his snaps. And I thought Hawkins was okay, held his own too. Yep. But if, 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 I'm telling you right now, if by some stretch of the imagination the Cardinals upset the Giants and pull off this win, it's practically a lock. Zach Ertz is going to make a key play. Oh, okay. I thought you were going in a different direction with no, that statement. No, it's, it's – <laughs> he, he, okay. he is the thorn. He is the thorn. Forget about the other guys. Zach Ertz sees blue, and he knows it's time to make a play. Because what you could be laying out here is – Let's say they get an explosive play with Hollywood Brown or Rondell Moore. Ertz is the finisher. You know what I'm saying? They get into the red zone. Dobbs is going to look for Ertz. It's what he or does. McBride. It's yeah. what he does. He's been he's been doing this for years against the Giants. Well, and also, which was interesting, and part of this I think was a product of I don't think Arizona wanted Dobbs to take a lot of chances. They wanted to emphasize protecting the football. But if you just look at the targets. so well, Dobbs, 10 targets for Ertz. It was by far the most well, in the, in the, correct. the team. But I was going to take it a step further. If you include McBride, 12 targets for tight ends. Let's just look at it through that standpoint. Every young quarterback's best friend is the tight end. That's the way this game works. That's because there's usually a shorter route to throw to. Okay. And because of the tight end's physicality, usually he can help box out yeah. and and give the the quarterback a better box to throw into to get the completion. That's just the nature of the game. No, I agree with you, but I would say also if you're Dobbs, you could dump it off to James Conner. You could also use Rondell you Moore. Could. And he didn't utilize those guys a lot in terms of volume. I'm telling you, Zach Ertz has gone to Dobbs and said to him, I got these guys. Look for me. Look for me. Whenever you see... Whenever, <laughs> well, he whenever, already established that against know, Washington. Exactly. So. But against the Giants, oh yeah. Ertz wants that. Ertz wants 15 targets this week. 30 pass attempts for Dobbs. Then he was sacked three times. So he dropped back 33 times, 12 to tight ends. Mm -hmm. I mean, do the math. Mm -hmm. You're talking about one position that absolutely dominated things. Now, once again, it'll be interesting to see whether or not they open things up a little bit more once again because of the fact that this is now another week with Dobbs and the personnel getting on the same page. But as far as the Giants are concerned, if to some of the last caller's point, if you want to see the real Giants, I think you used that phrase, mm -hmm. it's got to start with Daniel Jones having time to survey the field and get the football into those options. That's why for anybody right now who wants to talk about bringing in another wide receiver, this and that, it's extremely premature. Can we see a game or two where there's actually functionability where Daniel Jones has an opportunity to target his wide receivers as well as his tight ends. You didn't get a lot of that based on game flow against the Cowboys. This is one of those games, and I don't always advocate putting your defense on the field first, but I would like to see the Giants' defense on the field first, okay, so that they can get foaming at the mouth and Wink can be aggressive and Wink can play some bully ball and set the tempo on the Cardinals' offense right out of the gate. Show them who's boss and who was going to control this game from the get-go. I would like the Giants' physicality on D to be able to get that spark going right away. I, I would not want the Giants' offense on the field first. After what they showed the other day, I'm a little more fearful that they would not be able to deliver that first right cross. I feel the defense would be better suited to do it. Well, you know how you solve that riddle. You win the coin toss. So if you can work your magic, Paul, <laughs> I suggest you uh, maybe consult with some higher powers or shine up the coin or whatever it may be because that's your best option to get your wish. But as far as, once again, evaluating the passing attack, Daniel Jones, 28 pass attempts, seven, though, 
were sacks, so 35 dropbacks in mm-hmm. total. It just there wasn't enough at bats to truly get a feel for what potentially this passing game can do. Waller did get five targets, but you know, once again, based on how the game played out. I don't even think they tapped into him. And then no. Jones spread the wealth for pretty much everybody else. But if you expected Daniel Jones to have an opportunity to go for a home run in that game, then I think you just were not watching the game close no. enough because he had no time to even consider that. So anything with respect to guys like Paris Campbell, with respect to Darius Slayton, you just you had nothing No opportunities to truly say, okay, this is what they can do with them within the confines of this offense. In some ways, that's the best thing that could have happened to them, though. Because they didn't put a lot of film out there in terms of how they could operate. The Cardinals really don't know what the Giants are, especially offensively. They just don't know because they saw this avalanche that, in my opinion, was an aberration. I mean, do they know anything about Jalen Hyatt? They don't. No, because, once again, he barely... Had an opportunity to truly show his so, feet. Yeah. So, you know, I think I think that's the one silver lining here if you want to look at the big picture. If the Giants had lost this game 24-23 to on a last-second field goal, there'd be a terrible gut punch there because you will have played hard. You will have lost a heartbreaking game. You'd be thinking about it all year about how that's a game you should have won, you could have won, you can't get it back. And you'll be also saying, man, we delivered a really good, strong blow to the Cowboys, and they still beat you. No, for me, I think big picture, philosophically wise, it's a heck of a lot easier to wash away a 40, 40 to nothing wipeout and say that wasn't the real Giants. Dallas did not get their best shot. It's done. It's finished. Nothing about that game is relevant in week two. Move on. I think, I think that's easier to do. The other thing with respect to matching up in personnel, which we didn't bring up earlier, Jonathan Gannon's been in the division each of the last two years. He was the Eagles defensive coordinator. Now, Arizona's not running identical to what Philadelphia did, but there's some similar concepts. As far as an edge there, I would say I think Gannon has the edge, and this is why. Even though some of the Giants' personnel changed, not all of it changed. Gannon is now operating with a completely new group of personnel mm-hmm. on the defensive side of the ball. So the Giants don't have as much of a grasp, even though they've seen the Eagles' defense, in terms of how he utilizes Arizona's personnel, with the exception of, as I mentioned, Kaiser White in the middle, a linebacker. Correct. Whereas Gannon has a better read on seeing the majority of the Giants' offensive personnel, the offensive linemen, and so forth. So if you were to ask me who has an edge there, at least going into the game, I would say I think Gannon has the edge. Mm-hmm. That could obviously balance out based on how the game goes, but Gannon's seen more of the Giants versus what the Giants have seen in terms of the Cardinals' defense. I concur with that. Let's head back to the phone lines. Shelly is in the Bronx joining us here on BBKL. What's happening, Shelly? What do you got for us? Hey, first time, long time. I'll be 80 years old in March, so I go back. And Very I'm nice. Paulie De- you know. <laughs> uh, I saw Chuck Carnley... Uh, Paul Nisfari, Roach, Schaffner, Little Mo, et cetera. We can go down those rides. Well, thanks for calling today. You got it, Jim Lee Howell. You know, okay. And, in fact, uh, I'll make this one quick. Remember Ali Sherman? He loved this guy, Joe Bissaha, uh, in training camp. So he got rid of uh, Buddy Dial, who Pittsburgh picked up, and who was like an all-pro. Having said that, uh, I was at the Pat Summerall snow game when they beat the Browns. They didn't go to the following week when they beat them 10 nothing to go mm-hmm. against the Packers. Okay, let's let's go up. Last week, before the game, when Shane Lemieux was announced not starting, uh, I must have uh, my pressure must have gone up because I do not like most of the offensive line, unfortunately, which was unfortunately proven. Uh, I think Lewinsky is kind of over the hill. Evan Neal is a question mark, even though he hasn't played many games. Perhaps he's going to wind up as a guard. We don't know. Our left tackle, unfortunately, is trying to run down an interceptor, and now he's got the hammy, and you know what hammies do. And I think Izudu and McKeithen and Lemieux have to get in the game. And um, that's basically right now or today where I'm at. And I love you guys and, of course, uh, Schmelk. And I hear you most of the days, and I'm glad it's the first time calling. And sure, I would like absolutely. To call again. All right, Shelly. So, uh, yeah. What do you, yeah, so, you know, I don't want to gloss over anything, but I'm very concerned with the offensive line. And I love Shane and Dave, but we all do. 
But I don't know where they thought Lewinsky was going to uh, be the guy. And there was, has been a question mark. I'm going over the same thing I just said. But uh, I'm really hoping that we can solidify that line to give a few, a second and a half more for our great quarterback. And we got a tough schedule, so there's uh, no easy pats uh, in this game. Pat sure. team does it. Yeah, well, I mean, that so, goes without saying, Shelly. And listen, we'll let you go on that note. Appreciate the phone call. The offensive line has to improve. The play in the trenches overall has to improve because if it doesn't, then it doesn't matter who the matchup is the opposing team is going to be able to dictate the tone. So I think they realize that internally. I think everybody who obviously pulls to the team realizes that from an external standpoint. You go back to Glowinski and Bredesen being the first men up with respect to guards. I think part of it was... Experience. Yeah, I think that goes without saying, especially, once again, when you're playing next to a rookie center in John Michael Schmitz. If you start putting in a Zudu and McKeithen, who didn't play at all last season, you're now taking one guy who doesn't have much experience, and you're making it now a trio of that. I think that was a big part of the influence. How do we help John Michael Schmitz? You do that because you have the two most experienced guards on the right and the left of him. Like I always say, it's easy to have hindsight, and it's easy to second guess, but going in, you advocated that plan for several weeks. Absolutely, I did. You're going to play Dallas. Dan Quinn has a very quick, aggressive, strong defense. He's going to stunt and twist a lot in the front to do everything he can to confuse John Michael Schmitz. Don't you want to give him at least a sporting chance to be able to deal with this from a mental perspective? Because the physical always comes after the mental. If you don't have the mental stuff down, you have no chance to physically match up against anybody. So you advocated it because it made sense. There was a lot of logic behind it. Okay, so it did not work. That doesn't mean you just scrapped the whole thing after one game. Yep. Now, they may make changes this week. Let's make that clear. They may. Certainly, it looks like they may be forced to at left tackle if Aaron Th- if Andrew Thomas isn't able to really go. That's a possibility. So that could be a change. Could they change out one of the guards? Certainly, they could. They could. But this has got to be something that they need to feel comfortable with, understanding where John Michael Schmitz is only his second week into his rookie campaign. And you don't want to then have the center take a step back because Correct. of issues around him. Remember, be, it, care, be careful yeah. is all I'm saying. Be careful. You could do it. But be careful. You better be pretty sure that 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 young rookie is going to be able to handle it. See, you can make one change and think you're helping one cause and wind up hurting three other things. Exactly. That's why you got to be careful. You don't. Oh, go ahead. I will add this: if you're going to do a change like this, at least you're not doing it against a superstar defensive front. The Cardinals' defensive line is the kind of defensive line that you might be able to experiment a little bit. Experiment a little bit. The, You're certainly not going to experiment well, against San Francisco. Yeah, but the problem is you don't That's have. That's not going to happen. But Paul, you dance around and experiment. Then before you know it, you're going to play the San Francisco Forty Niners. So I know. You got to be careful. It could then hurt you on the back end of that. But yeah, I don't think the Giants are necessarily hitting the panic button after one game. So I could see some changes, but a complete revamp that may be a stretch, especially yeah. going into just the second game of the season. So, with that being said, that is going to wrap up Friday's edition of Big Blue Kickoff Live. Appreciate everybody for tuning in as the Giants are going to go up against the Cardinals at 4.05 p.m. Eastern. And then we will have full reaction starting with a new week of Big Blue Kickoff Live on Monday at 12.30 p.m. Eastern. A reminder, today's episode of BBKL is part of the Giants platforms everywhere and Giants.com slash podcast. I love we had two first-time callers, by the way. Absolutely. Folks, if you've been listening to the program for years, believe me, it's a lot of fun to hear from new voices. We don't always want to hear the same people every single week. I just want to throw that out there again. Let's emphasize, we love hearing from all the fans, especially the ones who have not gotten a chance to dial us up. So applaud, applause for those guys for calling us. There we go. And, Look, we and, and the let's get, let's get some more new yeah. ones. And for you guys who did call one time, make, make sure you do it again. 100%, yes, do not be shy. And perhaps somewhat of a subliminal message to those that do call in all the time to let the others get yes. a little taste of the party. How about that? All right, that's all the bookkeeping that is necessary here on the program. We appreciate everybody for tuning in. Enjoy the weekend, enjoy the game. We'll speak to you on Monday right here on BBKL. Have a good one.